Scared to death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I am Dan, and you're Lindsay. Oh my God, how did you Beat know you that? you to it. <laughs> uh, the last bit of horror for January, just sneaking this in as we transition to February when this episode releases. Mm-hmm. Coming right in at the final minute of January. Uh, very quick announcements, going to race through them, and then we are into a lot of horror. Go, go, go. New Spoopy merch. By this point, we've all heard of him. Some of us have seen him. I hope not. Actually, uh, Aaron Rodgers, randomly, football player, uh, recently uh, has uh, spoken out about supposedly seeing this entity. Waking from the hazy fog of a deep slumber, you feel the thick air turn blisteringly cold. Your heart aches as it pounds faster and faster, feeling the room seemingly collapse in on itself. You can't move. You can't hear. Fighting to break free from the paralyzing nightmare, you bolt upright in a cold sweat, only to see the thing you've been afraid of for your entire childhood, perhaps adulthood as well. The Hat Man. Adulthood. Adulthood. <laughs> uh, new Hat Man tea now available at badmagicmerch.com. I like to play with the uh, emphasis. You put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> no, but I just saw it randomly as I'm reading that. Just Aaron Rodgers, you know, quarterback for the Packers. Yes. It was a big thing in my news feed about ever since an ayahuasca trip, he has been haunted by the Hat Man. I, I didn't know that that was a possible side effect of doing an ayahuasca trip. I guess so. Uh, recording this in advance. So skipping a wet, hot, bad magic summer camp announcement this week. Uh, but you can go to badmagicmerch.com, check out the promo trailer we put together, read all about it, and grab some ticks. Yes, we'll have an update next month. Uh, do, um, uh, okay. And then I do want to thank some creeps and peepers really quick for coming to the opening night of my new stand-up tour, the Burn It All Down tour in Spokane, Washington. Uh, met some of you, Lindsay and I did, during the yeah. meet and greet. It was amazing. It really was special. Uh, thanks for being so cool. Thanks for selling out the Boise shows as well. And uh, in St. Louis and Kansas City and Denver. Uh, tickets still available to the added show in Sacramento, San Antonio, Dallas, and more. Go to dancummins.tv for ticket links. And then now a quick donation reminder from Lindsay, and then we're into the show. And then we're off. Okay. Uh, just a quick reminder that this month's charity of choice is the Museum of Tolerance. And uh, if you want to learn more about the Museum of Tolerance, you can go to themuseumoftolerance.com. And their mission uh, there is that they are dedicated to challenging visitors to understand the Holocaust in both historic and contemporary contexts and to confront all forms of prejudice and discrimination in our world today so check them out awesome awesome organization yes truly and uh and what horror do you have to take us out of january today well i haven't done this in a while i have a very long story okay followed by just a little baby story nice my big story is about a lot like a very long family curse attachment but so many people within the same family yeah uh really creepy story really really odd and then my second story a ufo situation okay and like you know i just have such a problem with ufos and yeah. the potential of that and this story yeah we haven't, I, had, we haven't had a listener submitted ufo ufo story in a long long time i don't think i don't think so it's been a hot minute and i was up most of the night just like oh uh, god thinking about it we have I, I and i do want to thank our fans just for sending in the best horror tales just mm, week after yeah. week after week it's incredible Yes. Um, I have two stories, two collections of tales, again, like last week. And uh, like last week, my first story will focus primarily on one encounter tale. For the first story, we head to Canada to the beautiful and reportedly very haunted Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel. Located in the incredibly scenic Banff National Park in Alberta, we will meet several of the seemingly harmless ghosts who reportedly reside at this hotel and then focus on one possibly terrifying, not uh, harmless at all, perhaps, haunted former room. And that'll all make sense soon. And then I'll uh, take everyone to York, England's historic treasurer's house. 
Numerous spirits, including a lot of Roman soldier apparitions, have been allegedly encountered in this historic residence built next to the famous York Minster Gothic Cathedral. It's a little mix of history and the paranormal on that one. So once you're all cozied up, I'll take a few minutes to set up this first story. I want to show off my socks. I have very, very special socks this week. They are from our friends over at New Holland Brewing. Yeah. If you are in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, or Illinois, you can find their goodies. Their hard liquor is actually so delicious, so yeah. good. I love their American gin. And then they do... We are not like huge lovers of pre-mixed canned cocktails. Yeah. They always taste like a little weird. Even like I'll drink a high noon. Yeah. But like the the he, the right. like the like the tiki punches or whatever, they're usually like too sweet or gross. They crush it. They have this yeah. blackberry bramble thing that is like Oh my god, it's so delicious! And yeah. now, now they have more, and they're not sponsoring us, by the way. Yeah, and, no, we and, just love them. They're they just don't good even guys. Want, they're like, don't even worry about a shout out. Oh uh, they constantly give us uh, stuff, and they're just great guys, and it is so good. I haven't tried this yet, but based on their other premix stuff, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. This Dragon Share Cherry, it's like a bourbon barrel seltzer. Yeah, so it's like I think it's going to be less blackberry. sweet. Mm -hmm. And just look it's at the packaging. Can you just hold it up for a second? Yeah, just cool. They just do cool stuff. Yeah, and they're just good guys who just. Totally. Uh, Really enjoy what they do. Good yep. people. And yeah. Big, big bad magicians. Yeah. And just so just again, like they're not sponsoring us. We just, we love them. It's a relationship of mutual respect. And we got some presents and we wanted to show them off to you. Yeah. Just got them right before the show. And while you're listening, you can stare at the awesome Valentines of Dan and I that are also for sale at the Bad Magic store. Yeah. That Logan put together. So cool. You can see our little faces in front of the candles. So cute. Okay. So here we go. Here we with go. this first one. The massive, historic, and beautiful Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel is located in the incredibly scenic Banff National Park in Alberta, Canada. It's so scenic. Some pictures of this place do not look real. The massive stone hotel is surrounded by thousands and thousands of perfectly needled pine trees rooted into the steep sides of rocky and snow-capped mountain peaks. This destination hotel has been in business since 1888. <laughs> it was built after the Canadian Pacific Railway expanded through the area and people needed a place to stay during their travels back and forth, east to west, west to east, across this giant northern country. The original structure was entirely wooden, but after a fire destroyed it in 1926, the hotel was reconstructed with a steel frame clad in limestone, and its new impressive look was based on the design of Scottish castles. In the 1930s, the hotel quickly became one of the places to be in Canada, seeing several royal and celebrity guests, which combined with its design, led to its nickname of the Castle of the Rockies. Hmm. The hotel offered, and continues to offer, access to activities like skiing, dog sledding, skating, golf, fishing, horseback riding, and more, as well as a world-class spa and different restaurants. And now I feel like I'm giving them a free commercial, but it truly is a very impressive hotel, grand and luxurious, and also haunted. Commercial or not, it's not like you can go there. I know. Let's not even get into that. There have allegedly been numerous tragedies that have taken place at this hotel over the years, from accidents to suicides to murders. Mm -hmm to some odd secrets. And now possibly due to all that and maybe more, there are continual reports of paranormal activity. For instance, there was once a secret room in the hotel because of a contractor error. Or there was once a secret room, perhaps due to someone trying to cover up some dark secret. This room had no windows or even doors. Not even the owner knew about it. This strange room wasn't discovered until 1926 after another fire started in the hotel. And ever since that room was uncovered and opened, Apparitions have been seen roaming in that area of the hotel. What once happened in that sealed room that may have led to these apparitions? No one seems to know. Another apparition named the Bride of Banff Springs is one of the most commonly reported ghosts, so much so that her image is on collector stamps and coins. No one is sure of her identity, but the most commonly accepted story is that she died in the 1920s when she fell down the stairs after tripping on her dress the day of her wedding. Oh my God. Some, yeah, how terrible. Some stories say the bride caught her heel on her dress. Others say she brushed against a flame, caught her dress on fire, which caused her to panic and then fall. The bride ghost is commonly seen wearing a veil and dancing in the ballroom or walking up and down the stairs. Also, some staff have reported, seen, uh, reported hearing strange noises from the bridal suite, even when they know it's empty. Another named spirit is Sam the Bellman, hmm. described as helpful and cheery and a ghost that looks so lifelike He's often mistaken for actual employee. How weird. This ghost is assumed to be the spirit of Sam McCauley, 
once one of the hotel's bellmen in the 60s and 70s. Reports of his spirit appearing in the hotel started right after he passed away in 1975. Sam is known as a harmless, again, even helpful spirit who allegedly once helped two elderly women who called the bell desk because they were locked out of their room. Uh, the bellman was busy at the time, and when he finally got to their room, the door was unlocked and the women were now inside. And the women reported that an older bellman wearing a plaid jacket had just helped them in. Uh, they were not told that there was no older bellman on duty that night or working there at all at the time. Sam has supposedly helped other guests unlock doors, turn on lights, even he even help people carry bags, as in actually lift them up and carry them to the rooms. He is often seen on the ninth floor and will reportedly generally disappear if you try to talk to him or after he's helped you if you try to tip him. <laughs> there are also reports of Sam appearing in his old office, which is now a guest room, and reports of cold spots associated with the spirit on the sixth, seventh, and ninth floors. In addition to Sam and the bride, there are a few reports of a ghost bartender, a few more of a headless man playing the bagpipes. All of these spirits so far have never shown themselves to be malevolent or threatening. There's only one area of the hotel that seems haunted in a more terrifying way. Room 873. This room, if it still exists, is no longer open to the public. Room 873 is allegedly the site of a double murder, although hotel staff deny this. Uh, according to hotel lore, a man killed his wife and daughter in this room. Oh, my God. Before he then took his own life. Uh, there's other uh, lore associated that he just killed uh, his wife. There was no daughter. And then he was taken to jail. A couple versions of the story. Uh, according to this lore, the hotel initially tried to refurbish the room after the tragedy, replacing the blood-soaked carpet, mattress, furniture, uh, repainting the walls before continuing to allow guests to stay there. But then eventually chose to board it up due to the volume of frightening guest complaints. Some guests have reported having their pillows yanked out from under them as they've slept or being violently pushed completely off their bed. Other guests in room 873 have reported being woken up by screams. And when they've turned on their lights, they've seen bloody handprints and more uh, in and on the mirror. Mm -mm. Uh, the entrance to room 873 was supposedly eventually sealed off, now blends in with the walls. Yet another sealed room in the hotel. According to blogger, I'm Mr. Fabulous, <laughs> who went to the hotel to investigate the missing room. Employees are forbidden to speak about room 873 and, quote, their scripted answers are as disturbing as the missing room itself. Another blogger, Bernie Roski, writing for the uh, blog Project Engineer, writing for the blog Project Engineer, noted there is no room 873 per se. From the hallway, there was a room 871 and 875, with an unusually large gap in between them. Where the door to room 873 seems like it should be, the wallpaper is peeling. Apparently, many people have knocked on the wall and reported hearing different sounds coming from where 873 should be, as if it is bricked in or similar. When Bernie talked to the concierge, he was told that the ghost stories about the room are a hoax, and room 873 was combined with room 875 during a renovation. He wrote... This was clearly a well-trained response and thus can probably be assumed as the hotel's official position. The concierge insisted that there are other ghost stories in the hotel, such as Sam McCauley, the bellman, and the ghost bride, even wanted to tell me these stories. Hence, they seemed very interested in promoting ghost stories in general, perhaps because they add to the mystique of the hotel, and thus bring in paying guests. But they don't want to address this paranormal legend, so the mystery of room 873 continues. And now modern investigators don't have access to this supposedly haunted site to try and get to the bottom of the mystery. But there are still a few stories from when guests were able to stay in the old room from back before it was either combined with another room or sealed off because of malevolent activity. The following comes from a supposed former guest of this room uh, who at an unknown date reported quite the terrifying encounter involving a mirror before the room was altered. Quite the piece of hidden hotel lore, if true. Time now for the tale of a murder in the mirror. I was 22 when my parents first attempted to find a husband for me. My father was a top executive in the automotive industry. We weren't the wealthiest of our city's elite by any means, but we were pretty well off. And my parents were very conservative. I had to beg them to allow me to go to university after high school. Being the very strong traditionalist they were, my mother and father insisted that I didn't need an education since I was going to marry a wealthy man but it was something I'd always wanted to do, so I insisted. I loved every minute of my university experience. It wasn't until my senior year that the dread began to set in. I had promised my parents that after graduation, I would start searching for a husband, in my mother's words. 
It seemed like her worst nightmare was me reaching the age of 25 without finding a husband. A year passed and my parents were frustrated, to say the least, that I wasn't engaged or married already. I didn't even have any suitors. As the year reached its end, I learned that I wouldn't be able to put things off any longer. My parents were now stepping in for me and moving things along. On Christmas Day, they announced that they were going to the Banff Springs Hotel for New Year's. My father had a suspicious twinkle in his eye, and my mother pulled me aside later that day and informed me that many of my father's colleagues would be there as well for the holiday, and some higher-ups, most of whom were bringing their sons. One of these sons, let's call him James, was a 28-year-old eligible bachelor looking for a wife. Poor James, I thought to myself. 28 and unmarried. He must be trying to preserve his freedom for as long as possible, just like I was. This was how I ended up at the Banff Springs, sitting at a large table with my family, my father's colleague, and his family, attempting to eat a meal in an extremely tense and awkward environment. My mother and James's mother had spent the past 10 minutes going back and forth over our various accomplishments. Neither of us had spoken a word beyond basic introductions. I learned that James had a master's degree in business, and he was learning the ropes so he could take over his father's company upon his retirement. He was an avid skier, hunter, and fisherman in his free time. I made eye contact with James as we sat at the table together. He seemed nice. At least at first he did. I also couldn't deny that he was a handsome man. But the longer I looked at him, the more I got quite the strange feeling. It wasn't apathy or any form of dislike. As I reflect on it now, I suppose he made me... nervous. At the time, I couldn't figure out why. I wasn't trying to impress him. In fact, I secretly hoped he was displeased with me so my parents would move on from the idea of him as a potential husband. Before the meal was finished, I was finally able to identify what made me feel so strange about him. It was his eyes. They were, I suppose, just a regular dark brown, but there was something about them, an extra hint of darkness, perhaps, that made me uncomfortable. Following our lunch, James invited me for a walk around the main floor that afternoon, not wanting to go outside in the snowy weather for our first conversation. It was during this walk, after we both talked a bit about ourselves and our interests, and things took a very unexpected turn. Let's be straightforward, shall we? He asked. All right, I answered, now feeling worried as to where this was going. James checked for any passerby before leaning against a wall and crossing his arms over his chest. I felt the need to take a, sm a small step back. Both of our fathers want us to get married. I nodded in agreement. You seem like a fine girl, he continued. You're pretty and you have a good education. I know that I'll have a reliable career and can provide a good life for you and any children. So, how about it? My jaw dropped. Are you asking me to marry you? Right now? I suppose I am. I laughed. This is absurd. We only met two hours ago. I began pacing up and down the little stretch of hallway in front of him. You're saying no. I paused. The idea was ridiculous to marry a man I didn't even know just to get my parents to leave me alone, but part of it was appealing. I knew men like him were always working, so I wouldn't have to see him much. I could do what I wanted, when I wanted, as long as he wasn't one of those overly controlling types. I'll marry you on two conditions, I asserted. I want to do as I please, no ordering me around when it comes to my daily activities, and I want to work. He seemed taken aback for a moment at my directness, but then he nodded. Fair enough. I should be frank as well. Don't expect me to act like a doting romantic husband. Fair enough, I parroted back. He grinned and told me, we've got an engagement to announce. Both of our families, of course, were ecstatic. They stayed up late into the night celebrating, gushing about the whirlwind romance and how they were the perfect matchmakers. I couldn't say I felt the same. Instead of relief or happiness, I felt a sense of dread. I went to bed that night with heaviness in my heart and worry weighing me down. All I could think over and over was, what had I just done? It seemed perfect on the surface. James was a successful man, a rich man even, who could provide a good life for me and my future children. But there was just something off about him. It was more than his eyes, but I couldn't figure out exactly what. After tossing and turning for what felt like hours, I drifted off into a surprisingly deep sleep, and then I woke up feeling groggy. My eyes were heavy, my body urged me to lay down and go back to sleep, but I was extremely thirsty. I got up and poured myself a glass of water, and as I was drinking it, my eyes shifted over to the mirror in front of my bed, and what I saw made me jump. I knew that there was no one else in the room but me. But nevertheless, I was seeing the image of a man and a woman in the mirror. I checked all around to make sure I was in fact truly alone, and I was. But they were still there when my eyes returned to the mirror. My mind struggled to understand what I was seeing. How could there be a reflection of anything that wasn't actually there? 
I even got up and looked out the window, thinking it might just be a reflection from outside, but all I could see were the snowy grounds of the hotel. There wasn't a soul out there. When I came back to the bed and sat on the edge, they were still there, and now I could see the man shouting at the woman. I found myself slowly waking as a strange scene captured my interest. I wasn't sure what I was seeing. At the time, I still thought I might be dreaming. I must be, which is why I was more interested than scared. The man was obviously furious, waving his arms wildly and pointing his finger accusingly at the woman. She seemed worried, clasping her hands together and seeming to plead with the man to stop. He continued even grabbing her arms and shaking her at one point. I leaned closer to the mirror, watching the scene before me as if it were a movie. The man shouting escalated. His face was red, forehead veins bulging out. The woman was almost white. She was shaking, fear clearly visible in her body language. I wished I could hear what they were saying, but it was like I was watching a silent movie. The man suddenly reached his hand out, out of my view, and when his hand returned, he was now pointing a gun at the woman, and I saw her gasp. She began pleading with him again. I thought I could read her lips. It looked like she was saying, please stop, please stop. I was still interested in what I saw before me, but I was becoming afraid too. I'd never liked the horror or crime genres, and that's what it felt like I was watching. I found myself worried for this woman, wanting to somehow go into the scene and calm them both down before something terrible happened. I started to question if I was really still asleep. I saw the man point the gun at something behind the woman. She screamed, no, and stood up bravely, taking a step closer to the gun. The man was shouting again. He was moving so erratically that it was hard for me to read his lips. But I thought I caught the word, die. I could tell the woman was still pleading with him to put the gun away. I watched the scene horrified, hypnotized, while at the same time questioning if all this was real. I told myself this had to be a dream. Without any warning, the man now pulled the trigger and shot the woman in the chest. Her mouth opened in shock. She put her hand on her chest, covering the wound, and took one stumbling step forward before collapsing on the floor right in front of the mirror. Without thinking, I got up and kneeled in front of the mirror myself, touching my hand against the woman's reflection, where I could see the blood pooling onto the floor in front of her. And when I took my hand away from the mirror, my hand was covered in blood, and there was a bloody palm print on the mirror. I gasped, my body jerking away from my hand that looked like it wasn't my own. When I looked up, the man was standing in the mirror, towering over me from his place behind the woman, glaring directly at me with his dark eyes. I scrambled backwards. Terror was taking over my body, making my heart pound, my palms sweat, and my body tremble. I reached for the phone to call the desk for help. I no longer thought this was a dream. This had to be real. I saw the murder happen right in front of me. The man was still looking at me. When I picked up the phone, he slowly shook his head as if warning me to stop, and I found myself hesitating. I looked down briefly, and when I looked at the floor, I saw the carpet was clean despite the fact that I had touched my bloody hand to it. When I looked at my hand, my hand was clean, and I looked up, and the mirror was now empty. All I could see was the reflection of my room and my own form staring back at me. It was like all I had seen had never happened. I put the phone down, sat on the bed, rubbing my eyes wearily. What had I just witnessed? After thinking it through and replaying the scene over and over in my mind, I had myself convinced it was all just a strange and terrible nightmare. That was the only explanation that could possibly make sense. Morning came sooner than I wanted it to. I'd actually managed to fall asleep after reassuring myself that what I saw was not real. I got myself ready for the day, avoiding the mirror at all costs. I heard a knock on my door before I was about to head down for breakfast. I looked into the peephole and saw James. Instead of excitement at seeing my new fiancé, I felt nervous and not in a giddy romantic way. James knocked again. I opened the door, he gave me a small smile, and told me that he was here to escort me to breakfast, but asked if I would mind if he stepped inside to fix his tie in the mirror. I could see that a knot had come close or come loose, and stepped aside to allow him in, ignoring this breach of propriety. I stood by the door and looked out into the hallway, waiting for James to fix his tie. He was taking longer than he should have. When I turned around, I saw him standing in front of the mirror, hands by his sides, his tie fixed. He was just staring at his reflection appearing transfixed, and an uncomfortable feeling settled inside of me. James? I said quietly. His head turned towards me. I gasped and took a step back. James was looking at me in a way that could only be described as sinister. It was his eyes. They looked just like the eyes of the man in the mirror, and his face. Oh my God, he was the man from the mirror. How had I not put that together before? James? I said again, my voice shaking. The glint to his eyes was only there for a second, perhaps less than that, and then his face went back to neutral. A friendly expression. He seemed concerned and asked me what was wrong. I quickly came up with a lie, saying I thought a bird was going to crash into the window behind him, and then we made our way down to breakfast. I felt relieved that this was the last day of the trip. That night, I went to my mother's room and begged her to let me end the engagement. 
But no matter how much I cried and begged, she told me that it was too late. I must never ask again. She warned me not to let my father hear of it either. Thankfully, it turned out that I would never marry James. My father received word that James was seen out on a date with the girl after our engagement, and to his credit, he called the whole thing off. I had never felt so much relief in my entire life. Well, that's not entirely true. I would have felt even more relief, or I would feel, excuse me, even more relief after later hearing of the horrible crime that James would commit. A few months after father called off the engagement, I saw a short announcement in the news about James and his new fiance. It filled me with a sense of dread and worry for this woman. I would never call myself a person who gets feelings about things or someone who can predict the future, but I did have a terrible feeling about this marriage. All I could think about was the man and the woman I saw in the mirror. Day after day, I was troubled with the question, do I find this woman and tell her and risk seeming crazy? Or do I watch and wait to see if what I witnessed in the mirror was indeed a prediction of the future that I worried it was? And then before I could decide, it was too late. I heard from my father that James and his new fiance returned to the Banff Springs Hotel, secretly it seems, in advance of their wedding day. And that now James had been arrested for murder. He'd shot and killed her. My father seemed white as a ghost when he relayed all this to me. My father always had an impeccable perfect memory, and he trembled and looked away as he told me that she had been killed in the same room he'd booked for me to stay in when we were there, room 873. With tears in his eyes, he apologized for pressuring me. He clearly wondered if he'd almost gotten me killed. And had he not called off my engagement, I think that is exactly what would have happened to me. My parents never tried to pair me with the suitor again. A small bit of good news, I must selfishly admit, in this otherwise dreadful tragedy. I will forever feel guilt for not warning the woman he killed, even though a part of me knows she would have never heeded my strange premonition. How weird. Mm-hmm. When you were telling that, I did keep waiting for you to say, and then he tried, like, when she was, um watching the scene unfold in the mirror yeah i did keep waiting for you to say like and then i realized it was james it was me like right I was like, right that's that's what it has to be that's what it has to be james and somebody else maybe well obviously obviously yeah yes yeah, yeah. Ugh. Uh, i do have some pictures okay it is a very picturesque place this first one just a, a pic don't, of the historic don't tease me <laughs> fairmont bam springs oh my Hotel. god that's beautiful yeah just emerging from the trees holy crap i mean here's another one i mean holy shit uh, this place is ridiculous. My this God. Big castle in the mountains. Must be like a luxury resort. Mm-hmm. Here's one from the early 1900s. So it's looked pretty cool for a long time. Yeah. Really well maintained. Yeah. Uh, this next one is the tombstone of Sam the Bellman. Oh, Sam. Sam McCauley there. Uh, and then this next one is where room 873 is supposed to be. You see that long Oh, yeah. That is of... a long gap. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Also, not very updated on the inside, that hotel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know how old that picture is exactly. So maybe it's been updated since, but I'm not sure. I was like, oh, like ceiling that tiles that you, can, that you can push up? I don't think you can be a luxury <laughs> resort with that. And then finally, the staircase where the ghost of the apparition named the Bride of Banff Springs has reportedly frequently been witnessed. I mean, what a sad, sad thing. Yeah, if that's true. If like oh. on your wedding day, falling down the stairs and dying. What are the chances? I know. Oh. Yeah, what a swing. What a... What a wild swing of emotion mm -hmm. for everyone else to go from so much joy and excitement to just now it's funeral yeah you're just like because you're on the precipice of this new phase of your mm -hmm. life that's so special but like uh yeah. yes i think it's is it precipice precipice maybe precipice what did i say precipice like a recipe you're on the recipe of a, <laughs> this is the recipe of your new life. This is the recipe for the rest of your life. <laughs> Falling downstairs. No. Um, oh, okay. On Sam the Bellman, I I mean, I don't think that you necessarily would have the answer to this question, but yeah. if he shows up yeah. and he's carrying your luggage, yeah. I do wonder what that looks like for other people. Can they also see Sam carry your luggage or is your luggage just floating through the air? I, I never heard, I never came across any floating, uh, you know, accounts yeah. of seeing like things like floating through midair. Yeah. So I'm guessing that everyone would just see what looked like a real person. How funny. Mm -hmm. And I like that when you, I, I actually was going to ask like, what happens if you try to tip him? But ah. you answered that of an in your story. Apparently that vanishes. He, just, he doesn't want your money. Nah. That's no good where he's from. <laughs> right, right. He can't spend it where he's going. Yeah, yeah. And I did think about when you were telling the when she was having the premonition in the mirror. Yeah. It's like, we really have no idea what happens in a hotel room before we occupy it. Right, right. People go, like, 
people use hotel rooms, you know, as like weekend getaways with their lovers, affairs. Totally. Uh, some people just hole up there and work. Mm -hmm. Some people are trapped in there for a couple of days because they're sick. Like, I don't know. It's just some people are on the run from the law. I, but truly, yeah. it's like it's such a bizarre thing to think about how a hotel room is shared by so many different people in so many different circumstances. And then, you know, I believe like you leave uh, an energetic impression everywhere mm. you go. So like, we're like getting a little piece of everyone's energy everywhere we go. Yeah. Especially because we travel a lot for work. It's like, I don't know. I don't want to overthink about it. Cause I think yeah. I'll be. They're very unique places. Hotels. They really just a are. It's a constant flood. Just people coming and going, coming and going just so quickly. Day after day, new people. Who invented the hotel? That's right. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure like, some form of a hotel has been around for thousands of years, you know, like uh, back in, you know, the Roman Empire days. Totally. There was people, you know, traveling from one place to another that needed to stay above some kind of inn or whatever tavern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just like evolved into mm -hmm. such a massive moneymaker, like yeah. Hilton, Marriott, whatever. It's just. Yeah. I know, I know in different periods of America, like in the 19th century and stuff, when somebody would be widowed, which sadly was, you know, often, mm -hmm. and there weren't that many jobs uh, available for women, especially women with kids, mm -hmm. they would often turn like uh, their house, you know, like rent oh, out a yeah. room. Like a bed and breakfast? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Just kind of just convert to some form of bed and breakfast to pay the bills. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Huh. Fascinating. Fascinating. You feel like moving on from Canada to the UK? Yeah, I don't like Canada. <laughs> We love our Canadian <laughs> listeners. I just, uh, story for another day. Oh. Our frustration with Canada. I made a note. Okay. I just want to revisit really quickly that room that wasn't discovered until there was a fire, not 873, but the other, the other one. other room, yeah. I like very much think that some very naughty torture chamber kind of murdery things happened in there. Some H.H. Holmes stuff. Mm -hmm, I think so. Now for some history, followed by paranormal encounters that seem to revolve around spirits connected to that history. Some of them from quite some time ago. The ancient city of York is pretty centrally located in the UK, about a four-hour drive north of London, and inside the county of Yorkshire, Yorkshire's long, in an, uh, long inhabited history dates back to approximately 8,000 BCE. Over the millennia, it has been occupied by Celts, Britons, Anglo-Saxons, Romans, and Vikings. And now, of course, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, York is one of, the Engl uh, one of England's most historic cities and allegedly one of its most haunted as well. The centerpiece of York is the York Minster, a cathedral dating back in various forms to the 7th century that boasts some of the oldest stained glass in the world, finished in the 14th century, and just behind the minster, which was completed in the 15th century, lies a beautiful old mansion known as the Treasurer's House. The original Treasurer's House was constructed in the 11th century. All the remains of the original house now is a single wall that forms part of Gray's Court, another historic residence in York. The current house was built in 1419 CE. The role of the treasurer ended in 1547 with the end of the English Reformation. The Young family, descendants of Archbishop Thomas Young, maintained the house into the 17th century, and it was then owned by several different individuals over the next two centuries. The house, as it is known today, was renovated in 1897 by Frank Green, an industrialist and keen art collector. You know, you familiar with the name? <laughs> yeah. Uh, by 1900, he had transformed the ancient mansion into a townhouse. Green then donated the house to the National Trust, a preservation organization in 1930, and it has remained open for visitors to come and admire it and Green's vast art collection and award-winning gardens ever since. Mm -hmm. Since the house has been open to the public, there have been hundreds and hundreds of allegedly paranormal encounters, 790 official ghost sighting reports and counting as reported by one source. Not sure what makes a ghost sighting official, but that's what they wrote. In 2021, the Treasurer's House made a list of the top 10 haunted locations in York. Sightings are said to include everything from the ghosts of Roman soldiers to the spirits of two of the mansion's former owners, including Frank Green. Time now for the tale of the ghosts of the Treasurer's House. Green was very attached to this residence. Before he died, he nailed studs into the floor to mark where he wanted his furniture to remain after his passing, allegedly, and threatened to haunt the mansion if anything was moved out of place. <laughs> I like it. And after the furniture inevitably was moved, it seems, it seems as if he made good on his promise. Reportedly to this day, if staff members have to move furniture to work on the house, they report smelling smoke in the room. Green frequently smoked cigarettes for much of his life. And before he died, the man whose spirit would go on to haunt the treasurer's house allegedly came very close to having his own paranormal experience in the house. He was once hosting a party inside the mansion when one of his guests came across someone who looked like a Roman soldier. Hmm. 
She assumed he was a man in costume dressed up for the party, and she asked Frank who this rude guest was. She told him that he had blocked her from entering a room using his spear. Frank insisted that none of his guests were dressed as Roman soldiers. Then the woman nearly fainted when she realized she had just had a real up-close encounter with a ghost. This Roman ghost, the first of many I'll talk about today. In addition to a lot of Roman soldier spirits, another ghost that has been supposedly witnessed on numerous occasions in the old house is known as the Vengeful Ex-Wife. This spirit has been most commonly encountered in the tapestry room. At one point, the mansion was split into apartments and a married couple lived in one of the units. And according to local legend, she murdered her husband after she caught him having an affair. Ever since, some male visitors to Treasure's house have reportedly been pushed by invisible hands in the tapestry room. The vengeful ex-wife, not the only female spirit who seems to call the Treasurer's house her home. Several young children who have visited the house over the years have reported seeing a woman dressed in all black standing behind them in one of the home's mirrors. Still other children say they've seen a woman dressed in gray. On more than one occasion, when children have climbed onto the furniture and are reprimanded by their parents, they have said something to the effect of, oh, it's okay, the lady told me I could. In addition to Roman soldiers and several female apparitions, even the ghosts of both a dog and a black cat have been reported to have been witnessed roaming about throughout the mansion. It's as if something about the location of the treasurer's house in York is sticky, like there's something about it that just keeps spirits hanging around, or that keeps replaying moments from its past. And speaking of moments from its past, the most well-known paranormal story about the treasurer's house by far comes from Harry Martindale, who claimed to see something both shocking and terrifying and really phenomenal uh, back in 1953. The then 18-year-old Harry was installing the central heating pipe in the cellar of the treasurer's house when it happened. He set up a ladder next to an original Roman road that had been excavated. His first day on the job passed without any incident, and Harry returned the next morning to continue working. Then, around noon, as he worked on the stone ceiling, it happened. He suddenly heard what sounded like a trumpet close by. He described the sound as just the blare of a note coming from inside the wall he worked next to. The sound soon stopped, and now when Harry looked down from where he was working on the ceiling, he saw a man who looked like a Roman soldier walking straight through the wall. When the man passed by him, Harry looked back at the wall and now saw another soldier sitting on top of a large horse, also emerging from the stone. Then he said he witnessed about 20 more soldiers, all walking through the wall after the first, armed with large spears and shields. Harry could not only see these apparitions, he said he could hear their boots stomping on the hard floor. At first he thought they were shuffling along on their knees somehow, but as they got closer he could see that their legs ended strangely without any feet. But then he could see the full length of their bodies once their feet touched the old excavated Roman road. They marched ahead determinedly, not seeming to notice him. Harry certainly noticed them. He was so afraid he ended up falling off his ladder and then hid in a corner. The specters he saw were so detailed, it was like he was staring at men who were still very much alive. The soldiers he watched carried large round shields on their left arms, spears in their right hands, long swords and sheaths hanging from their belts. And then one soldier carried what looked like some sort of trumpet, the noise he'd heard. The men wore plumed helmets, had their beards grown out, and wore shiny tops over green tunics. They wore red skirt with strips of leather, their sandals tied up to their knees. He described them as tired and scruffy looking. Harry ran upstairs as soon as he felt safe, and then according to this encounter tale, the curator saw his horrified expression and said, Ah, you've seen the Romans. <laughs> uh, he had seen them too, apparently, on more than one occasion. Harry explained what he saw over 40 years later in a 1999 interview with The Y Files, saying, I start to hear a musical note, no tune. And I thought... Oh, it must be a radio or something. And then it gets louder and louder, and I realize it's coming from the actual wall. Now, when I realize this, I just glance down, and there in my waist on the right side, uh, I saw the figure of a Roman soldier come out of the wall. First thing I saw was the helmet with the plumes. Now I knew whatever it was, it shouldn't be here with me, and it was almost a complete figure of a Roman soldier. Say almost a complete figure, because when he came to the wall, I couldn't see it from the knees down. Then a horse started out from the wall with a Roman soldier sat astride straight across the cellar and followed the first Roman soldier to the wall. Once the horse had cleared the wall, their uh, Roman soldiers were coming out in twos. I didn't count. I was in no state to count them, but I saw at least 20. Harry was extremely distressed by what he saw. He wanted answers. He wanted it to make sense somehow. He spoke with local papers, historians, military experts. Of course, very few people believed him. Several academics in York ridiculed him, saying that what he described was not historically accurate for what they knew about Roman soldiers. It was clear they thought he was lying about the whole thing, hoping to gain some kind of notoriety from the story. 
Well, not only did Harry not really gain anything over the encounter, he lost money. He quit his job, wouldn't return to the treasurer's house for 25 years after he had been somewhat vindicated. Years later, some archaeologists in York were working on uncovering the remains of York's Roman occupation. An ancient Roman road had been found under the cellar during excavations, exactly where Harry had seen the soldiers marching. Harry may not have seen the Romans' feet initially because the roads in the first century, when the Romans occupied York, were 18 inches below the current street level. For a long time, it was believed by historians that Romans wore their sandals just to their ankles, but archaeological findings later disproved this for at least some Romans. It was also believed that Romans in this era used a rectangular shield, but again, archaeological discoveries showed that Romans used round shields for a time. As more new findings came in, historians learned that Harry's description matched Roman auxiliary soldiers rather than legionnaires. Auxiliary uniforms were excavated that matched Harry's description, once he had uh, one he had given without any prior historical knowledge. Auxiliaries used their own weapons and had different uniforms than the legionnaires. These soldiers were called the Forgotten Army because Rome's main forces were called to defend the Fallen Empire, and these soldiers were left behind to defend the territory, and they were often overworked and underpaid. The York Minster lies on the main road leading from the fortress gate to the headquarters of the fortress called the Viaduct Romana. The York Minster actually sits atop the former headquarters. Harry gave his description of the soldiers before these discoveries were made. The new archaeological evidence gave some credibility to his story. Harry Martindale went on shortly after his sighting of the Roman soldiers to become a police officer. In the 1970s, after new dis dis uh, in the 1970s, after new discoveries gave his story more credence, a group of scholars interviewed him on TV, which made the ghost of the treasurer's house known to a wider audience. He was interviewed several times after this over the years, and then he passed away in 2014 without ever changing any details of his story. His son Andrew defended his father when interviewed after his dad's death, saying that Harry was never paid for telling the story. He never profited off it in any way. If anything, it made his life harder, not easier, and could have kept him from getting work as a police officer. Harry himself wasn't even actually sure he saw ghosts. All he would say was, I only believe in what I saw. But what else could he have seen other than ghosts? And many others have claimed to see these same Roman ghosts and many other ghosts long after Harry first shared his story all in the treasurer's house. That's cool. Yeah. I want to see some Roman soldiers. I know. What a very unusual paranormal sighting. Yeah. I know when you were talking about them not having feet, but then like the feet kind of showing up later, in my mind, I did think, I'm like, must have something to do with like the roads. Like they can, <laughs> so dumb, but like they can't show up on this road because this road didn't exist before, right. but they can show up on this road because it did exist. Yeah, what they're a, stuck in some old loop or something. Yeah, what a strange rule. Mm -hmm. Like, ah, ah. That one's before your time. That one's after your time. You have to stick on the one that's only in your time. I know those kind of sightings to me feel like some kind of glitch in the matrix. Oh. Like, like you're just seeing a little like snapshot into the past rather than a sentient entity that is existing after it's dead. Like you're just seeing like a living entity almost like a little like window into like a, a previous time for some reason. Okay. Okay. I can support that. Uh, got a couple pictures. Okay. This first one is the impressive York Minster. Holy Hades. I know. Isn't that cool? Wow. Yeah. What a building. And now it operates what? As like a museum? Uh, uh, I think it's an active church still. Oh, still? Okay. Yeah. I think. Uh, this next one is the York Treasurer's House. So there's a cool house, you know, right next to the church. I know. I do love like English. I guess it'd be an English manor. Yeah. Uh-huh. They're so, so cool. Uh, I couldn't find a good pick with decent resolution, but this pick was taken somewhere beneath the treasurer's house where Harry allegedly saw the ghosts of Roman soldiers. So just like, you know, down there when they were excavating. Okay. And then, you know, at the time he was there, they weren't excavating. He was just like working on, you know, something in the cellar. Sure, sure. And then the last one, a cool uh, old illustration of what Harry may have witnessed and what a sight that would have been. I mean, that would be, and I'm going to use it. <clears throat> that would be wild. <laughs> yeah. Wild, Absolute. cool, and interesting. That would be, I'm going to start a new word. We can, we can just say wick. <laughs> which is an abbreviation. Just encapsulate all that. Yeah, but I mean, that would be so insane if you're mm -hmm. just down there and then, and, and also like the fact that those soldiers weren't trying to interact with him in any capacity. He's just yeah there and you just look over and you're like, what is happening? Yeah. And then, da, da, da. very cool. Very cool. I would, I would be into seeing something like that. Yeah, because that doesn't seem like a scary ghost encounter, does it? No, it just seems, well, I mean, obviously we know that Romans existed, so right. that would be 
kind of fun because it would make you feel in touch with this piece of history that we can't really understand, no matter how much you would study it. It would just be like, oh my God, that is exactly what I've been studying, you know, or what I learned about in school. Like it just, um, yeah, like an application of what you've learned. It would be, yeah, it would be really awesome. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be scared at all, actually. Well, then that's the one. Maybe we, maybe we need to go there someday. Except <laughs> yeah. once you see that, then it makes everything right. else all bets are off. Plausible. Yeah, that's the problem with seeing something because mm -hmm. it's like once you open that door, Ichiwawa. There's no going back. There is no going back. Have you seen anything recently? No, I have not. Remember how? Wh when was it that you thought you saw something in Kyler's room? Just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, a couple weeks ago. But nothing since? Nothing since. Not feeling any like weird, heavy energy in the house? Mm -mm. Me either. Maybe it really was just a bad dream or something, something that lingered. Yeah, 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 in your, totally. In your psyche. Uh, yeah. Nope. I'm back to, never mind. Just kidding. I don't <laughs> want to see any Roman soldiers. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Uh, so my first tale, I have a weird, like lifelong family. I don't know if we want to call it a curse. Maybe it's an attachment. Uh, what I find so fascinating about this story is it, it happens to a family of many people. Yeah. They move on. They don't all live together. And still, it seems as though everyone's still worried about it. All right. Which is peculiar. Yeah, I'm curious to hear these details. Yes. Let's do it. Hey, y'all. Absolutely love your work. My mom's super into investigating these kinds of stories and was the one who introduced me to your show. Cool. She teases me for being a skeptic and is the first to bring up any of the slog of unexplained paranormal events that have happened in our lives, but neither of us touched this one and for good reason. There's always the unspoken rule going around our family. If you talk about it, it's real. And if it's real, it can hurt you. Recently, I heard an episode involving mirrors and all the memories kind of spilled out of me. I hope that by writing this all down and making it just a story and distancing myself from it as much as possible and sending it to y'all, it will make me feel like I have some semblance of control over it, real or not. I can handle the nightmares, the odd scratches, voices, images in my periphery. The hours of lost time, I have a harder time explaining, but most of my supernatural experiences, I can chalk up to an overactive imagination or badly hung door hinges, family pranks, or something chemically off in the houses that we've lived in over the years. There is a reasonable and practical explanation for these things, or at least there should be. Look, I know this sounds like a trope, but I do know when I am awake and the difference between a childhood memory and a dream. I have been able to lucid dream since I was a child. It's a skill that most of my family members share. And I don't mind nightmares, really. If anything, being able to lucid dream makes them more of a fun riffing session than anything to be afraid of. I have a handful of experiences that are different. The details don't fade when I wake up. Or rather, they haven't faded yet in the years I've been having the dreams. Memories, dreams, whatever they are, they started when I was around five years old, nightly, and they have petered out, or at least to just once a year, over the two decades since. I can't change any of the details of any of them while I'm stuck in them. By the time I realize what the dream is, I'm stuck knowing what's going to happen and reliving the same terror every time. It's like the world's worst ground Groundhog Day ripoff, but I'm basically a fetus and completely ineffectual to change any of it. I should clarify before I start that, yes, we had a dog in the house at the time, a fluffy eight-pound dog with a princely personality and four paws, each the size of dollar coins at most. Everyone in my family made it a point of pride to make sure that his white, curly coat was spick and span and that his claws were never long enough to make a noise on the wood floor downstairs, let alone long enough to hurt anybody. No one in our family has ever had any kind of pet with hands, child-sized or otherwise. It's the summer in Western U.S., late 2005-2006. My brother, mother, and I are living with my grandmother and extended family while we're figuring out a pretty awful living situation. I don't know as a kid how bad it actually was for us at the time, but I do know that my mom is often away from home for work. There was always at least one adult or adult-adjacent family member watching my brother and I, usually one of my teenage aunts or uncles, but when the dream starts... It's in the transfer gap coverage of people watching us. 
It was a tight squeeze with about seven people living in a two-floor, 800-square-foot condo, but I was stoked to be around family I had missed every day before I moved in. It was the middle of the day, maybe dusk. I'm chasing my older brother, Nick, around the top floor of the condo in a circuit of a game, hide and chase me. If you're unfamiliar, it's kind of like hide and seek, but you chase the target and tag them, making them it instead, and the cycle continues. The upstairs are all interconnected in a kind of square. The stairs set in the middle of the layout, so the second floor was a near-perfect racetrack. Mm. Anyway, the sun is up through the west windows of the condo. It's starting to set through the stiff metal blinds in the hallway over the stairs, the only light source making everything burnt and golden. I trip into the bathroom sink cabinet door, chasing Nick into my grandmother's ensuite. He's laughing at me, and I'm a bit frustrated because he's ahead, but I'm laughing at myself too. I pass the sink mirror, snot running all over my face. I'm red as a tomato. Normal. I duck into my grandmother's room, a hallway that doubled as her closet space, when something to my left catches my eye. Movement. There's a three-way mirror that my grandmother called her boudoir. Cupboard boards lined the right and are full of her clothes, household knickknacks, and so on. To the left is a bare counter that comes up to my shoulders with storage cabinets underneath and then a three-way mirror above that to the left and to the right. The left side of my head and my grandmother's bed, my face and the closet cupboard boards behind me, and the right side of my head and the bright bathroom I just left. Again, it all looks normal, like every other time that afternoon I'd run past the mirror or be- of being chased. Each displays a view of me. My small blue eyes blink back at me. My freckled face is less pink now, and my self-cut blonde bangs push back and up with tacky sweat. It's what I saw in the other mirror, above the bathroom sink, and every other time I ran by. But I know staring at myself in this boudoir that I'm looking at this time is somehow different. I hear Nick cajoling me from the other room, probably getting bored with my delay. I hear him, but I'm frozen to this spot, staring at the three images, trying to figure out what has changed why my chest feels so tight at the bone, a chilling sense of wrong I'm feeling as I look in these mirrors. I dart my eyes back and forth here and there, in the middle mirror a dark, viscous shadow seeming to ooze out of the cupboards behind me. I whip my head to squint at the corresponding cupboards above my head, but I can't see the same shadow that I see in the mirror. I open the few that I can reach to double check. I step closer to the mirrors to try to see the shadow more clearly. It could be a makeup smudge on the glass. My grandmother hates smudges of any kind being anywhere in the house, and if I clean it, I can tell her about how I took care of it later. I step closer, and this is when I remember in my dreaming that this was something I once lived through. It's a memory, and I can't change anything about what is about to happen. I step up to the three-way glass, up and off the carpet onto my tiptoes, opening the cabinet door in front of me to use the shelf inside as a stool, bracing a hand and foot on the counter to try and wipe at the smudge with my shirt hem with my free hand. It doesn't do anything. I reach again, stretching. I hear Nick teasing me again from my grandmother's room. He's found another hiding spot, and I still can't reach the spot in the mirror. Straining, I'm finally able to wipe at the spot where the shadow is on the mirror and my palm slips on the wiped counter. My nose hits the edge and a wet, fleshy sound as I smack my palms on the counter and catch my foot in the cabinet I used to get up. I look up, hoping I at least have bragging rights for cleaning the smudge. But instead of the smudge wiping off, the shadow on the mirror has grown as if the door is opening. The same cupboard door is slowly opening in the two other mirrors now as well. One after the other. I look back again at the cupboard behind me, confused, because again, they're firmly closed. Something wet drips on my upper lip and I taste the metallic nickel sting of blood, but the red on my fingers and palm when I pull them away startles me. The pain starts then, pain in my face and limbs where I caught myself and I cry out for Nick. I hear him tumble out of whatever hiding spot he's crammed himself into and the thudding footfall of him coming to help me, but my gaze sticks again on the middle mirror when I try to turn or run away. In retrospect, it was only a moment before Nick got to me, but something about fear dilates the time between one blink and the next. He's only a room away, but somehow there is still time for two small hands, each the size of my own or a bit smaller. They're tar black, scaly, and clawed. They don't all belong to one creature. They push open each of the cupboard doors completely all at once, 
I hear the slam of wood on wood behind me, and I can't turn around to check. Somehow there's time between one blink and the next for those two hands to become hundreds, tugging and pushing at the cupboard doors, opening and tearing at the wood. I feel hands on my legs, my shoulders, pricking my skin, tiny and uncountable. I scream again for Nick, blubbering and swatting at the hands, blood still oozing freely from my nose and my own red handprint staining my shirt, shorts, and socks. I turn my back to the mirror and collide with Nick, knocking us both over. Gracie, he says. Gracie, what happened? Why did you open all the covers? What did you do? Something like that in the moment, his voice sounds really far off and removed. He uses his own shirt sleeve to wipe the red faucet dripping down my face, tilting my head back gently to stem the flow. He tries to get the full story from me, and I try to tell him, but he doesn't see the hands folding in on themselves and folding back into the cupboards in the mirrors like I do. Nick just sees the open cupboards, and that I swear I didn't open, and my blood splattered on almost every surface. I couldn't have opened them. The top row of the doors were all far above my reach, and scratches on my body at angles too far strange for my blunt, bitten to the quick nails to reach." All he sees is the cupboard door I broke on in, fall, in, in my fall, the bloody handprints all over my own body, and the new tar-like smudge on the middle mirror. I wake up here, typically, but I know the rest from memory. I try to tell him about what happened, explain what I saw in the hands and the cupboards, wiping at the smudge and falling. Nick doesn't believe me, scolds me for playing around and breaking grandmother's things. My nose eventually is stopped with the toilet paper tissue, and we clean up as best we can but the blood still stains my clothes and the counter cupboard door is still busted. I get in trouble for it and I spend the next month apologizing and avoid playing on the top floor as much as possible. Eventually, it turned into a bit of an embarrassing family in-joke, like any of the other events just like it that happened over the couple of years we all lived together. Oh, Grace, always running around with the craziest bruises and cuts. Silly Grace, always climbing on counters, talking to the air, making messes and getting hurt. You know, kid stuff. Years pass and the dream or whatever solidifies as just a weird, repetitive dream I'd had every now and then as a child. Flash to 2015 or so, a rare family reunion near the same time of year. My aunts, my mom, my uncles, brother and me, stealing sips of wine, all reminiscing, sharing stories of a time that was far worse than I ever knew about. We share stories, the night lengthens. Laughing, embarrassed, I share my story about the hands in the cupboards and in the walls. The room falls oddly quiet. A shock, stilted laugh rises in the corners of the room and then ends just as abruptly. As it turns out, everyone who grew up in that condo, my grandmother, her seven now adult kids spread across the U.S., and two of her grandkids all have at least one memory like this from that condo, or the house they lived in together before that, or the apartment before that. One of my aunts says it's a demon of some kind, attached to our family, and that praying helps dissipate the dreams. My brother says it's probably an alien. What I dream is replaced, artificially implanted memory of an abduction, and there's nothing else we can do to stop the memories. The creature, whatever it is or was, is described in the same way across each story, repeated over generations and distance. No one talks about it except when we're all together and drunk, and from what I know, nothing has been done. The dreams repeat. I'm worried about my young cousins who ask me about the monsters in the closet cabinets and pantry doors, about strange experiences and their own lucid dreaming. What is there to say, really, besides the advice to keep their head down and to never linger in front of mirrors any longer than they have to? Thanks so much for listening, Grace. Yikes, Grace. That's so bizarre. Like a weird, yeah. like reality dream. Like what is happening? I mean, at first, I mean, despite, you know, how you set it up, I was like, well, this just sounds like a haunted house. Like, like there's something haunted in this mirror. Yeah. You know, like, like, you know, could just be a bad dream. But then she has this dream she thinks is a, was a started off as a memory, uh -huh. a real event. Then it becomes a dream. And then I thought that, were, that the other family members were, were going to have experienced it in the same house mm -hmm. in front of the same mirror, mm -hmm. which then it's like, okay, well, something about that mirror is haunted. Yes. But then to have that very specific phenomenon happen to them in different locations, Oh, how terrible to never feel comfortable in front of any mirror. And what a very unusual phenomenon. Just these little hands folding oh, in on themselves. God. opening door. It just, uh, it's kind of hard to visualize. I mean, I can get the gist of it. Yeah. But it sounds like one of those things you have to see to understand and you you don't want to see it. You know, like um, 
I don't know so if it's like heads. your mom or your sister. This is what I envision. If they yeah. ever had one of those little like vanities that has a, a, a trifold mirror. Oh, yeah. So it, like I'm just thinking about like sitting in front of that in your, yeah. especially as a young girl, like in a bedroom yeah. or whatever. And then just seeing like drawers or cabinets open and these little yeah. things like. Little hands come out. Ah! out of them. No, it makes me so mm-hmm. like eek. Uh, that that trifold mirror that was uh, cool too. Where it's like I don't know that we've had another story featuring that kind of mirror. Yeah, but it, but it just put me back, you know, in front of those mirrors. Like we used to have one growing up. I believe in my mom's bathroom, just her little like bathroom mirror. Yeah, the sides it was like three panels, and the side uh-huh. ones could tilt out, so you could see like the side of your head and stuff. Exactly. Yeah, you can look at the back of your hair. Yeah, yep. yeah, and just a bigger version of that. I thought what was going to happen for a second is she's looking at her own reflection, feeling off in all three. And how creepy would it be if oh two of your reflections are normal and one of them is just a little bit different? Oh my God. So like there's some kind of doppelganger, some entity or something. literally made my stomach just start hurting. Ah. That would be great in a horror movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like the way that Grace talks about all of her family like being spread across the United States and them each feeling something. Mm-hmm. I mean, it sounds like Based on what she said, the only suggestion is like, well, you better pray. You, so it doesn't sound like there's been any like major intervention attempted. Right. But how could you even address it? Because it, yeah, it feels what are you like. Addressing? Well, yeah, and it feels like, okay, if you had seven family members and everybody's experiencing something, whether it's exactly the same or just, you know, similar yeah. enough, I feel like you would all have to agree like, okay, on this day at this time, we're all going to, yeah. I don't know, like do a smoke cleansing, uh, salt the doorways, throw away all the mirrors in our house and buy new right. ones. Like, I don't even know what you do because I've either never heard of a curse or attachment. I'm not even sure exactly what to call it. Yeah. That that spans so much s- distance. Yeah, me either. That would be awful. Because mm-hmm. you probably think Feels like, so oh, I, I move out of this condo, I should be all right. And then like you go to your next place and it's still happening to you. And then you're right. probably not wanting to bring it up to your family because you're like, God, am I losing it? Am I crazy? What's happening? But then you do bring it up and they're like, oh, me too. And all these other people say me too. It, it feels inescapable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, you're just, you're trapped in this situation. Forever, maybe. I mean, I, I guess you'd have to get everybody together. I mean, or what? I mean, I say have to. Maybe what I would try to do is get everybody yeah. together and meet with like a priest, meet with a, a spiritualist, mm-hmm. and just try a various kind of cleansings over everybody. Like basically, like yes. a, oh, like, over like, the people like, instead of the places, like a family cleansing or like a family exorcism. Like you're trying to exercise an entire extended family. Oh my gosh! <laughs> one of that's. I'm mean, surely there's stories of that. I've never come across one that I oh. recall. I know, but sometimes, you know, just by like putting it into the ether, yeah, now, now, now you'll be now on the hunt it. for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Great story, Grace. I know. Great story. Well written as well. Really, really beautifully written. Um, whew. UFOs. Let's do it. How's your little black eyed yeah. Layla? Yeah. Thanks for uh, making me a little Layla coloring in this Layla's eyes. I just thought it'd be so silly. Mm-hmm. You have a red one over there too for Valentine's Day. Well, thank you. They, I just thought they could be like a cute couple. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh sorry it, it just reminded me the scene is latest of that fan who got a cool purple layla tattoo i know on her, their arm her arm oh i don't have my phone in here yeah. with me oh, wow. uh to well tell done. you her name amber logan if you happen to have your i'll look it up i'll look it up while you set up the story i have my phone in my pocket oh okay yeah you text it to me too yeah because also like i have a little layla on my wrist yep and i have a layla and here and you have a layla there so now we're like a weird threesome you me and Amber, and Amanda, Amber John- Amanda, Amanda Johnson, uh, Jaco- J- Jacobson. I was Gamble. so close. Amanda Jacobson Gamble. It's so cool. We're going to post it on social so cool. media, but it's, she got this really awesome, like on her bicep. Yeah. Purple Layla. Look yeah, at you that. You can, it's so hard to see here, but yeah. so cool. I love it. Okay. UFOs, baby. Okay. Oof. Continue to be something that I just am so scared of. I think more so than like a hat man or something. Cause yeah. I feel, I really feel like I could. Well, ghosts don't generally attack people. They don't take them anywhere. Yeah. They, they just scare you by the, by seeing them, mm-hmm. by, you know, freaking you out just like a, a, a malevolent seeming presence. Yeah. But then there are stories with aliens of, they grab your ass and take you into their ship. And then there's so many like uh, disappearances yeah. that it's like, well, God knows if what happened to those people, if it was aliens, Yeah. they, they might not be so nice. That's true. That's very true. It feels, that's true. <laughs> it feels like the alien 
whatever like uh i can't think of the word i want but like the the fear of alien feels like it just has so much more that can happen after that like mm. at least like with a a shadow entity it's like you see it and potentially it's gone but right. the alien thing feels like it's just perpetual yeah, like more likely to psychologically ter terrify you or terrorize excuse me you with a uh ghost or entity something like that gonna mess with your mind where an alien could actually take you somewhere else oh man treat yeah. you like a lab rat oh man okay this is a, a quick story but it is sometimes these are the best ones yep all right let's have at it Hello, Dan and Lindsay. I'm a fairly new listener as my daughter recommended your podcast to me and I've been binging ever since and want to share my story with you. And thanks to your daughter for turning you on to this show. I love this. First of all, I'm a 60 year old woman from Nebraska. So, okay, this is like a person who's lived a life and seen yeah. some stuff, right? As a child until third grade, we lived on a rural farm in a farmhouse that my dad had grown up in as well. There were four kids total and I was the oldest. While it did have running water, it did not have a septic system, so all water had to be carted out of the house after doing dishes and so on. This meant we had an outhouse behind the house. This might seem like a silly little detail, but you'll understand in a moment why it's so important. When I was about seven years old, I woke one night really needing to pee. So I got up from bed and proceeded to the path to go to the outhouse. We had a big light in the yard and a fence and a retired police dog. My dad was a <laughs> cop in the closest town. So there would be no danger for a child to go to the outhouse. And besides, it was just normal and one wouldn't think anything odd of it at the time. The dog would normally accompany any person leaving the house at night. However, I don't remember the dog leaving with me that night. As I came out of the house, I noticed a bright glowing coming from behind the detached garage, which was outside the fenced yard. I was a stupid kid and had never seen lights over there, so I proceeded out of the gate and around the garage. What I saw both amazed and terrified me. It's hard for me to describe, but I've never forgotten it either. The best way to describe it is huge pieces of metal somehow attached to other metal with horizontal beams and lights from the ground up to a huge blackness that blocked mm. out the stars. I couldn't understand what was at the top, but it seemed huge with like several of these legs going up into the darkness. The legs were all lit up with a bunch of lights and that is where the memory goes away. I don't remember anything after that. I guess I would assume I probably peed my pants, but there was no evidence of that the next morning when I woke up in bed. I ran from my room to tell my mom the next morning, and of course, she assured me it was just a bad dream. Now, I have had bad dreams in my life, but I don't really remember them or still have the terror feeling from the dreams long ago, except this one. I've never forgotten this, and I'm still terrified. Even writing this now, I'm covered in goosebumps, and my hair is standing up on my neck. Now, as I said, this was the house my dad grew up in. My grandparents had retired from farming and had moved into town where my dad was a cop. And as I said, yes, this was Nebraska. And you can Google cattle mutilations, Nebraska. Uh. And you will see that when I was approximately 14 years old, there were a series of mysterious cattles, cattle mutilations in Nebraska. Now, by this time, we had also moved into town and my dad was still working as a policeman. So he had to investigate said mutilations. People were talking about lights in the sky and blood being drained from the cattle. One evening, my mom and dad were talking and my dad said, maybe my mom, meaning he said, maybe my mom, meaning my grandma, wasn't crazy. And she really did get abducted by aliens. Whoa. And I was like, what? My parents then told me one of the reasons my grandparents had left the farm was because my grandmother had gone crazy and started telling people that Martians were taking her out of bed at night and doing experiments on her. For a while, she was even committed to a facility and medicated because she'd had a nervous breakdown. Oh my God. So did I see something in the field beyond the garage? Did my grandma not actually go crazy, but remembered being taken? In my opinion, what I saw was no dream. I have thought about being hypnotized to see if I could remember more of that night, but I don't really know if I want to know. I also never asked my grandma about it. She was elderly and frail and I didn't want to embarrass her. I did remind my parents of when I saw the object in the field, and this time, they listened to me. I think my dad actually sort of believed me and had questioned me a lot about it. Like I said, I'm now 60 years old, but I remember that thing as much today as when it happened. I will never forget it. Sincerely, Chrissy. Thanks, Chrissy. Like, ugh! Yee, yee, yee. Her poor little Grammy. Mm-hmm. 
I know. To have everybody think she was crazy, to actually, to actually have a nervous breakdown, oh. have to go to a facility if something really did happen to her. And that's so, uh, uh, that was a good detail to add like the cattle mutilations at that same yeah. time. And then what she saw, it, it does give it an air of greater credibility. Yeah, it just feels so like, what are the odds? Yeah, what was happening in Nebraska at that time? Just, uh, I do just think like, what if there are the, these aliens that just come down every once in a while and they take some people, do some things with them? Like, they're just running experiments. Right. And you what know? if it's not just even, like we run experiments on animals? Wasn't it? What if it's not even nefarious? Like from there, from the alien oh. perspective, they they just think that like, oh, we're just gonna go get some specimens. Like we are their lab rats. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I said. Lab rats earlier. It's like, yeah, we to them, especially if they're a very advanced intelligence. Mm -hmm. Like the di the difference between our intelligence and theirs might be the same rough distance as the difference between our intelligence and a rats. Oh my god. So to them, we're just ants, rats, whatever. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the drained blood. I know that's creepy. That's a very specific and bizarre detail. Yeah, I've read those stories about cattle mutilations and things. Oh mm -hmm. no, 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 it's no! Not no. always just cattle. Other animals that just get found out in the woods. I mean, tends to be cattle oftentimes for some strange reason. And there's a term for it. I want to say like sanguination or something. I can't remember if that's correct. Uh huh. But when a thing is just completely drained of blood. And they can't what and I'm I'm just asking, I don't even know if you know this, and I apologize mm -hmm. if I'm putting you on the spot, but does that indicate also that they can't find like any like track marks where like a uh, like an injection that like removed the, like where the blood was removed? I mean, yeah, so, oftentimes injection. it seems like that's how you know what I'm trying to say. Like a um, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of times they're like they've been dissected, like they've been cut in half. Sometimes what is that like a vivisection or just um, you know cut open and also drained of blood? They're not like uh, it's, it's not like they're fully like dehydrated covered. Yeah, and just de just really dehydrated. There, I, I do think there is always some kind of cut into them. I think, but I'm sure there's probably cases where they have a hard time finding out like, where did the blood go? Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't know. I can't pull those details from memory. I don't no, know. No, of course not. Of course not. I didn't know anything about this. So in my mind, I was like, like they're just drained. Like, like they just find a, a cow carcass and there's just no blood inside, but there's no sign of like where the blood went or how the blood was removed. No, I think they're usually like cut open. Okay. Okay. That makes more sense because I was like, I don't Yeah. That would be such a terrifying thing to suddenly start happening. You just uh -huh. find like weird, like, I don't know, just like coyotes or whatever. Anything. And they're just dead and mm -hmm. there's no blood inside of them. But also, how did the blood, how was Where the blood removed? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, God. UFOs, baby. So <laughs> scary. So scary. Do you want to do some shout outs or do you want me to go first? I can go first. Okay, go for it. I would like to thank the following Annabelles. Cody McCall, Chelsea Adams, Carly McCracken. I love McCracken. That's a great last name. Sarah uh, Filipovich, Bear Evil Incorporated. Well done. That's a little times like reference. Good job. Roar. Bear Roar. Uh, dude, Sideshow the Clown's Mom. <laughs> Kenny Rowan, Where is Dan's Dad? Nice, Kenny. Uh, Tanner, BD Daddy Harris. Uh, Kurt uh, Benez or Beans or Benz. Uh, Cassidy Willits, Nick Bosca, Jeffrey Huckins. Sarah Slotty or Slotty and Nora Montoya. Thank you for supporting what we do here. Do you think, wh what was the big daddy one? Big. Uh, the daddy one was yes. Tanner. It's B. Oh, I think I know what it is. Yeah, I think I know what it is too. Yeah, I just put it together. Yeah. B -D I was like, oh, BD daddy. Oh, oh, got it. Got it. All right. He's yeah. packing some heat. <laughs> I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's for their support on Patreon. April Barnes, Julia Mace, Clara Musser, Musser, Todd Zutenhorst, Megan Ryans, Chrissy G, uh, Tokes Dubs. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Toke has dubs. What? James Lau, Katie Smith, Yuki Chibi, Catherine Perry, Tracy Duane, Zachary Mann. Zachary, Z A C K A R I E. I've never seen it spelled oh, yeah. that way. Cool. Zachary Mann, Jasmine Glenn, and Gail. Auditor. Auditor? Okay. Is it auditor? It's got to be. I like Yuki Chibi. It's just a fun one to say. Chibi. Yeah, Yuki Chibi. Sounds like you're saying Chibi. I'm saying B. Oh. B. B. Yuki Chibi. <laughs> Enunciate <laughs> those letters. Uh, and then just a few spooby shout outs this week. Mm -hmm. To Aunt Kitty from Mila and Vin, happy birthday. To Chelsea from Yeggs, happy belated birthday. And to Kevin from Brooke. Happy 31st birthday to my amazing husband and best friend. Oh, that's so sweet. So, so sweet. 
And that is our show. Thank you for continuing to send your personal tales of terror for Lindsay to read uh, to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. We love them. You can email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith, Tyler C. for the work on social media, and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com, and thanks to Logan for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to our book editor, Drew Atana, for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. Woohoo! Uh, thanks to producer Olivia Lee for finding the first story I told this week, and to producer Sarah Finch for finding the second Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch a show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content. See the pictures that accompany each episode at Scared to Death Podcast or pictures of like the tattoo we showed earlier. Mm -hmm. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, with over 20,000 horror-loving members who want to meet you. 20,000? Over. Gosh yeah, dang. I think 20, oh heck. I don't know, 21, 22, 23, something like that now. Wow, you guys, I love it. Uh, you can follow us on TikTok as well, also at Scared to Death Podcast. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad-free and more. And enjoy your nightmares. Creeps and peepers, hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. We really have no idea what happens in a hotel room before we occupy it. Mm-hmm. I know.